So our last program of the day is uh, called Insights in Hindsight. And um, these will be reflections on imprinted by Michelle Bogart. She has been a tremendous advocate um, and wonderful guide, uh, not just for this exhibition, but through many projects we've worked on at the Norman Rockwell Museum. And she's really immersed herself in the exhibition, both in the planning process and also uh, once it was on the walls. And what uh, we're so thankful for is that she has come forward with some thinking about where all of this leads us uh, because the work is really just begun to consider these matters. And uh, from her art historical and cultural perspective, um, she's going to offer some, some thoughts on this. So thank you, Michelle. Okay, so uh, let's get started with the first slide, please. And I will raise my finger like that. Is that hopefully okay? So the Norman Rockwell Museum's exhibition in printed, highlighting how published images have worked to shape perceptions of race, contains many fascinating and distressing images and objects. They range in form from engraved prints to illustrations for late 19th to late 20th century mass market magazines, book, magazine, and album covers, illustrated ceramic plates, dolls, children's books, trade cards, and boxes for matches and anchamama pancakes. All trade in images of race, all offer insights. Some of those disclosures are obvious, others are thematically more obscured. As a scholar advisor for the exhibition, I was involved with discussions about the direction it might take and wrote an essay for its catalog. So obviously I'm an interested party to a certain extent. I had no role in the curation or choice of objects, however, and so my experience visiting the exhibition was as eye-opening as anyone's. I've tried to be objective in the responses I present here. What follows are some thoughts I had on visiting the show, a kind of biased uh, review perhaps. I'll first say a few words about the thematic flow of the exhibition for the benefit of those who haven't seen it. I'll then turn to some of my own readings of the materials which took something of a different turn. The premises, hello? The premises of the first portion of the exhibition are familiar and predictable. The first several galleries, spanning moments of colonial encounter through eras of civil war, reconstruction and Jim Crow, reinforce the thesis that prints and increasingly popular replicated images that permeated US culture served to shape an image of black people and other people of color viciously, essentially as caricatures. The objects show explicitly how those negative stereotypes were manifested. They display vividly the influence of reproduced images in justifying and abetting oppressions and injustices on a continuing basis. The negative effects still live with us. The subsequent portions of the exhibition offer a variety of postulations that I'll sketch out briefly here. Some of these findings are familiar to some people, though not everyone. Other revelations are less readily discernible. The second and far larger portion of Imprinted showcases how from the 1920s Jazz Age and Harlem Renaissance on through the civil rights and black power movements of the 1950s, 60s and 70s and onward into the present day, black illustrators and designers supported by sympathetic art directors and enlightened black, uh, excuse me, enlightened clients took charge of their own images. The galleries display, uh, also display work by non-black artists like Norman Rockwell, uh, who embraced and addressed the causes of civil rights and equality. But for the most part, the illustrations in these galleries highlight how black artists in particular celebrated racial pride and solidarity, articulated social protest, 
and depicted blacks, whites, and others in all their complexity and diversity. The cross-generational work of artists like Charles White, Ernst Krishlow, Charles Lilly, Jerry Pinckney, late Jerry Pinckney, uh, Hollis King, and Robin Phillips uh, Pendleton, to name but a few, uh, convey the affirmative dimensions of Black experiences through diverse styles and iconographies. Artists like Lily, Emery Douglas, and Kadir Nelson render the portraits of Black political heroes and martyrs, like George Floyd, as well as celebrity and other black icons. Other illustrations in the later rooms depict the evolving realities of racial oppression, as well as racial violence and its aftermath, both preceding and in the wake of the civil rights movement. Pictures by black artists and whites help bring these horrors home literally to middle America. Additional images and objects are active articulations of social protest. Some going further are assertions of black liberation of a deliberately intimidating sort, as with the forth, forceful work by Black Panther artists, Gail Asali Dixon, Emery Douglas, and Molly Edwards, whom we heard today. The final galleries highlight recent developments in illustration and representation by Black artists. Here are showcase in both original and reproduction form the diverse contributions of art directors like Hollis King and artists like Jerry Craft, Rudy Gutierrez, Chadra Strickland, and Jerry Pinkney along with iconographic New Yorker covers by Kadir Nelson, who helped define uh, the fields of illustration practice and perceptions of race, all of them, from the late 1960s into the present. The pictorial developments seen in these later galleries are on some level, le level of little surprise to those familiar with Black art history. The ar arguments about the shift in focus from stereotype to black empowerment could have been anticipated to some extent. Curators Plunkett and uh, Phillips Pendleton made the points forthrightly. And the contributions of different artists along with, um, excuse me, uh, different artists working with a, a, a range of different subjects were right there in the galleries to be seen, they still are, uh, quite conspicuously. Several other discoveries emerged more serendipitously, however. They weren't an overt part of the exhibition thesis or articulated in the labels, but rather something unanticipated and deduced, by me at least, in hindsight. These ideas became most evident when viewed from the vantage point of professional activity as windows onto the world, the worlds of commercial art practice several thoughts came to the fore. The first goes a bit against the grain of what a number of artists in the exhibition and catalog essays stated about circumstances facing black illustrators. A key theme articulated is the paucity of black artists within the broader spectrum of commercial arts industries in the United States. Another theme is that many of these practitioners felt isolated perceiving both personally and professionally the weight of the impact of racism that permeated and permeates United States culture. And they recall experiencing not only professional segregation and isolation, but also chagrin at not seeing very many positive images of, of black people. A number of practitioners uh, reiterated and in the previous session, in fact, uh, as well, that in a sense, uh, and I'm quoting here, but not an actual quote, but that there were just very few people who looked like me doing this kind of work or depicting people who look like me. 
There's no question that black artists were uh, underrepresented in the worlds of late 20th century commercial art. Uh, and late, I mean, essentially from the 60s onward. Uh, just as was the case with architecture, fine art, painting and sculpture, and most other professions. Historians must investigate and explain in detailed fashion why this was the case. The bottom line, as the artists in Imprinted make clear, is that Black artists faced discrimination. The exhibition showcases this and other negatives like stereotypes in many aspects. And yet, these recollections seem to be contradicted by the reality of what visitors see on the gallery walls, namely the striking number of Black artists in manifold fields of illustration practice. Thus, recollections notwithstanding, I was prompted by Imprinted to ask, is there another way to look at this situation? how to reconcile or test these possible disconnects between perceptions and real world practices. A productive route, I think, is through assemblage of data. What follows are some speculations and it's all speculation. In assembling and separating off to a great extent, though not, if, if not uniformly, the productions of late 20th century black artists, the exhibition imprinted revealed the glass to be half full rather than half empty. Indeed, an overt, important, and affirmative theme of the show is that the worlds of Black commercial art practice were expanding, nuanced, complicated, and multifaceted. This fact becomes clear when we examine activity and outlets of production as well as content. The galleries revealed black artists since the 60s and even earlier to be to have been engaged in commercial art making uh, labor of manifold sorts, taking the form of book, magazine story, and comic book covers and illustration, art direction, poster and postage stamp design and album covers, as well as illustration for product advertising, among other things. The general public, many scholars, and many artists are, for the most part, unaware of this Black illustration and commercial art activity. That our knowledge of this world of Black art praxis is so limited is itself a broader matter the reasons for which uh, I'll comment on a bit later. But here's one example of what I'm referring to. One can walk through the later galleries and see the work of quite a number of Black illustrators. Yet obviously this selection only provides, uh, a, 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 provides only a partial percentage of the, those people actually at work at any given point in time. I became especially curious about this, for example, on seeing two Charles Lilly paintings in the show. You see them, see them here. The second image is displayed and imprinted in its original painted form in isolation from the published advertising context. I learned from the label that it had been painted for an ad campaign for Anheuser-Busch. I knew nothing about that particular enterprise, but seeing the painting inspired me to want to learn more about the broader context that, that the exhibition did not provide. Who was Charles Lilly and what was this marketing project? Well, thanks to a May 2022 article by uh, E. James West, I learned that Anheuser-Busch had in, embarked in the mid 1970s on uh, an ambitious advertising campaign that would appeal to black audiences. They commissioned four uh, black artist illustrators. Leo, Leo Dillon, um, let's see, I'm not sure, go back one please. Yeah, uh, Leo Dillon, Paul Collins, Carl Owens 
and even uh, one woman artist, Higgins Bond, uh, which was very unusual really for the 1970s in advertising, they commissioned them to paint stories of the great kings of Africa. Subsequently, the clients brought on Lily and others. I'd never heard of these artists um, as a specialist in illustration, so it's my bad. Uh, but neither had several other illustration scholars. But I soon learned that all of these artists were highly prolific and had had very, uh, and still have some, uh, very distinguished careers working in areas ranging from book covers, children's books, postage stamp design, and advertising images for multiple clients. Uh, and then also Lily painted the cover for one of the paperback versions of the autobiography, uh, the um, autobiography of Malcolm X, for example. And it's, uh, the book is, and the painting are displayed in, in imprinted. So that's great. As is typical for artists working in illustration, few specialized in just one form. They did it all. They all did it all. And as imprinted and catalog essayist Shireen Sherrard Johnson and William H. Foster make very clear, there were many other black illustrators who did same. I wondered to what extent these apparently successful artists felt at the time, especially in the 1970s, that the glass was half empty and to what extent their successes were any less extensive than those of average, average, non-celebrity artists of other races and ethnicities. Had I not heard of these artists because they were black or because they worked in commercial enterprises, because they were illustrators and not fine art painters? Would the same obscurity hold true for other artists working in these fields? That is, could the problem be in part at least that a very small percentage of any group of commercial artists got name recognition or celebrity outside of their circumscribed realms of practice? Black artists surely experience these obscurity problems much more than others. But as one who studied the fraught relationship between commercial art and other forms of art production, I nonetheless wonder whether the deficiency of understanding of black illustrators lies in part with our deficit of knowledge about illustrators more generally. These questions, along with the newfound consciousness of the multiple illustrators involved with the Great Kings of Africa campaign, led me to speculate further. How many other black commercial artists may have been out there at that time or at any other time. If we don't know how many black artists were engaged in different forms of commercial artwork, how do we in fact assess beyond mere hearsay what low percentages of black versus white artists were operating professionally or received commissions at any given point in time? Here the challenge is broadened because as I knew from my research on advertising art, we don't in fact know enough about the constituencies of practice of white artists either, much less about the broader spectrum of art workers that might have included a wide range of people of color or other ethnicities, nor do we have an adequate sense of the ethnic makeup of that community of non-black people or the category white people. What were these social worlds of practice exactly? Thus, I would contend going forward, we need lots of uh, more concrete information about a variety of things. We need to know more about the lives of illustration practitioners, the individual bits of biographical data that will enable us to grasp more fully all of this illustration activity. And returning to the issue of black artists at hand, we need to find out more about others who were also at work, but who aren't re represented in the show. And Emory Douglas um, kind of 
re referred to this in his talk today, talking about the fact that there were a bunch of people working at the Black Panther newspaper and stuff who were also contributing to that, that whole enterprise. Um, and thankfully, uh, the other catalog authors and a number of other scholars as well as artists are, are, are doing this as well, this, this work of reconstruction. We also need to know much more about how Black artists formed art worlds, uh, both uh, art worlds in a sociological sense of nexuses of, nexuses of practice. Uh, these art worlds, both nebulous and coherent. We need to understand how those worlds were circumscribed professionally and iconographically around race and by the artist races. We need to know more about Black commercial art worlds as narrowly construed around skin color and its impact on hiring and practice. What was leading these men and women into these jobs? How were they obtaining these jobs? And how did the artist's commercial art practices align with other fine art work that they did? a matter about which historian Michael Lobel has written in recent months. We also need to probe how these nexuses of commercial illustration labor form part of a more extensive and fluid terrains of practice that were negotiated among black and white artists and those of other ethnicities and races at work in the worlds of advertising agencies film studios, graphic design studios, book publishing, and, and so on. They would include, for example, the Chinese American Tyrus Wong, about whom Karen Fung has written extensively, or the Arab American Joseph Habush, or the many Jews like Harvey Kurtzman, Will Eisner, Al Jaffe, and Ed Sorrell. Through such work, one might also ask, for example, what, what might the Black Ernest Krishlow and the Arab Habush, who both attended the School of Commercial Advertising, excuse me, the School of Commercial Illustration and Advertising Art, what might they have had in common? In, yeah. The mad artists, as with Norman Rockwell, Charles. Oops, no, uh, no, go back. I guess I goofed, okay. So the mad artist as with Norman Rockwell, no, go, go back, please. Thank you. Charles White and Reynold Ruffins are now well-known names. There were many anonymous others at desks at advertising agencies with whose names and work we are unfamiliar. Part of our ignorance about black artists certainly has to do with racial inequities in hiring and in the professional art system. But another factor is we don't know enough about these black artists because we don't know enough about any illustrators beyond the few who've been publicized through winning awards or getting press uh, otherwise or who have museums in their name. Uh, I guess go to the next, I forget what it is. Part of this obscurity has to do with the nature of commercial practice. Advertising artwork was tossed out. So the cream of wheat paintings, a lot of them were ultimately tossed out. Uh, their archive was tossed out. There are no company records here or in many cases. The situation is not helped uh, by the broader art critical and historical bias against illustration and commercial art more generally. There's presently no central database, no archives of American art for commercial artists. Although Roger Reed has been working on assembling one and the Rockwell Center and the Dowd Modern Graphic History Library and others have been collecting biographical materials. So there's work going on and a growing body of scholarship is fleshing out our picture of the art worlds of illustration and graphic design. How many of these unknowns within this broader pool were black or from ethnic backgrounds that simply have not yet been divulged? We just don't know. Rockwell 
Norman Rockwell was an illustration celebrity, but a celebrity was not like everybody else. What happens to our understanding of illustration and advertising design when we take the practices of everybody else into consideration? Uh, just leave it there. Uh, and so here's where we might start to move in new directions. In addition to those pioneered by imprinted, which has shown definitively the ways that injustices have been just sketched into the public psyche and then subsequently combated by both black and non-black artists through published images. Going forward, we must learn more about the communities in which these artists were assembled. Scholars need to take more in-depth socio, social, social, historical, sociological studies of the art worlds of advertising or commercial arts more generally. Such investigations would become more nuanced by having awareness of artists, art directors, and other practitioners, different racial and ethnic backgrounds, but also by taking account of the commonalities or other types of biographical and social data. Perhaps the acquisition of the Ebony and Jet archives will enable us to correct this situation somewhat. We need studies of, of these and other Black publications, obviously Black Panther and, and others, and of their office cultures from the 60s into the present. We need to compare these findings with what we know of the makeup and office culture of the advertising art divisions and practitioners of other leading magazines and art agency, ad, ad agencies. Taking Ebony and Jet, for example, Scholars might create lists of the names of those doing the art direction, the designing or the pictures to the extent that the advertising pictures, which may be mostly photographs, um, but to the extent that these images were signed, to the extent that they weren't signed, then it becomes necessary to connect the client name with the ad agency name and to try to track back whether there are records of which designers those agencies were commissioning for a given pro uh, product. This will not be an easy task. Most agencies chuck their records and scholars are dependent upon the holdings of libraries like Duke's uh, John Hartman Center or the Schomburg. This research process makes for a good deal of selectivity and limits on what we can learn, but we've got to start somewhere and that effort should be undertaken. To conclude then, although imprinted is all about race and illustration, it also shows us much that both includes and goes beyond that. Learning more about what that is, is a key task for the future of illustration history. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michelle, um, for those very important insights and really for um, acknowledging the continuation in terms of the scholarship that we hope to continue and hopefully others will as well. Looks like we've got some comments. Um, let's see. Uh, well, lots of people saying that they hope to see the show, which I hope so. Um, Alessandra show. said, happy to see uh, the work of Ernest Crishlow. And um, in general, I think we hope to see everybody. I invite my colleague, Robin, here she is. Um, Michelle, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And my pleasure. Look forward thank to you, expanding Michelle. the field of illustration studies, which you have spearheaded all these years. And we thank you so much for your foundational work in the area. It's meant so Most much welcome. to us. I'll mute my video. Well, we thank you all for joining us today um, and yesterday. We have uh, been grateful for all the incredible commentary and uh, for your attention throughout the day. And Robin, thank you for your partnership uh, and uh, for a wonderful exhibition. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful working with you um, and the museum. It's just been I don't have the words <laughs> for the journey.
Um, you know, but working uh, together has just been a dream. And, you know, to make this conversation um, happen visually, to make it, to make uh, the, the, uh, the catalog, the symposium, I mean, everything that has gone on um, with it all. And I, I want to thank everyone um, for your amazing, amazing panel presentation, uh, presentations and honest commentary of your lives and your craft and sharing that with everyone. Um, it was just truly, truly special. Um, um, and to add um, to the important and continuing dialogue that we really, um, I think we're convinced that it's gonna, it's gonna go on. I mean, there've been so many questions you know, about where are the illustrators of color? Where, you know, where have they been? I've been hearing this for decades. And, you know, in a day and, and a night, we, we've, we've had some really powerful conversations and to have everybody on this uh, symposium platform. Um, Indeed and we have, uh, I just, I'll just bring forward Colette Gator's um, comment. And uh, she said, Michelle brought um, let's see, where did that go? Such great points and gave us much work to do. And I think that is um, an important point that we have, a, we have a great starting point, but we look forward to expanding our research and our work. And Teresa Leninger Miller asked, um, let's see, with so many voices involved, uh, she said, congratulations, but also where, uh, where do we plan to go with the work next? And um, I'll just mention that our hope right now is to travel the exhibition and to make adaptations based upon some of the things that we have learned as we have gone. Um, as far as the Norman Rockwell Museum goes, we're also working with an advisory to um, think about the reinstallation of the museum's permanent collection within uh, different contexts uh, that will be meaningful in relation to this discussion. So look forward to sharing that as well. Robin, any closing comments? Um, I, I think that uh, this is all, it highlights um, the ongoing work of representation and identity and how important that is, um, you know, to continue the dialogue, to continue to ask the hard questions. Um, I, think, I think the show, or the exhibition does that, and I'm I'm just been uh, it's just been inspiring to be a part of the uh, the symposium, and just the energy that's going forward, you know, from this moment. And I hope everyone will uh, continue to be engaged in this valuable work that we're doing. We thank you all so much. Thank you for your wonderful comments. And um, we hope you'll, you'll visit us if you haven't been able to. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody. Be well.